Part 2. Perpetual Motion. And then we see it in the wheels. The wheels, which never like to rest, the wheels. How heavy are the stones themselves, the millstones. They dance in merry ranks, the millstones. W. Muller. Chapter 1. The Ships of the Archipelago. Scattered from the Bering Strait almost to the Bosporus are thousands of islands of the spellbound archipelago. They are invisible, but they exist. And the invisible slaves of the archipelago, who have substance, weight, and volume, have to be transported from island to island just as invisibly and uninterruptedly. And by what means are they to be transported? On what? Great ports exist for this purpose, transit prisons and smaller ports, camp transit points. Sealed steel ships also exist. Railroad cars, especially christened Zack cars, prisoner cars. And out at the anchorages they are met by similarly sealed, versatile black mariahs rather than by sloops and cutters. The Zack cars move along on regular schedules, and whenever necessary, whole caravans, trains of red cattle cars, are sent from port to port along the routes of the archipelago. All this is a thoroughly developed system. It was created over dozens of years, not hastily. Well-fed, uniformed, unhurried people created it. The Kineshma convoy waits in the Moscow Northern Station at 1,700 hours on odd-numbered days to accept black mariahs from the Butirki, Krasnaya Preznia, and Taganka prisons. The Ivanovo convoy has to arrive at the station at 0600 hours on even-numbered days to receive and hold in custody transit prisoners for Nerekta, Bezetsk, and Bologoye. All this is happening right next to you. You can almost touch it, but it's invisible, and you can shut your eyes to it too. At the big stations, the loading and unloading of the dirty faces takes place far, far from the passenger platform, and is seen only by switchmen and roadbed inspectors. At smaller stations, a blind alleyway between two warehouses is preferred, into which the black mariahs can back, so that their steps are flush with the steps of the Zack car. The convict doesn't have time to look at the station, to see you, or to look up and down the train. He gets to look only at the steps, and sometimes the lower step is waist-high, and he hasn't the strength to climb up on it and the convoy guards who have blocked off the narrow crossing from the Black Mariah to the Zack car growl and snarl, Quick! Quick! Come on! Come on! and maybe even brandish their bayonets. And you, hurrying along the platform with your children, your suitcases and your string bags, are too busy to look closely. Why is that second baggage car hitched onto the train? There is no identification on it, and it is very much like a baggage car, and the gratings have diagonal bars, and there is darkness behind them. But then why are soldiers, defenders of the fatherland, riding in it, and why, when the train stops, do two of them march whistling along on either side and peer down under the car? The train starts, and a hundred crowded prisoner destinies, tormented hearts, are borne along the same snaky rails, behind the same smoke, past the same fields, posts, and haystacks as you, and even a few seconds sooner than you. But outside your window, even less trace of the grief which has flashed past is left in the air than fingers leave in water. And in the familiar life of the train, which is always exactly the same, with its slit-openable package of bed linen and tea served in glasses with metal holders, could you possibly grasp what a dark and suppressed horror has been born through the same sector of Euclidean space just three seconds ahead of you? You are dissatisfied because there are four of you in your compartment and it is crowded. And could you possibly believe, and will you possibly believe when reading these lines, that in the same size compartment as yours, but up ahead in that Zack car, there are fourteen people? And if there are twenty-five? And if there are thirty? The Zack car. What a foul abbreviation it is. As for that matter, all the executioner's abbreviations... They meant to indicate that this was a railroad car for prisoners, for Zaklio Chenye. But nowhere, except in prison documents, has this term caught on and stuck. The prisoners got used to calling this kind of railroad car a Stolypin car, or more simply, just a Stolypin. 
As rail travel was introduced more widely in our fatherland, prisoner transports changed their form. Right up to the 90s of the last century, the Siberian prisoner transports moved on foot or by horse cart. As far back as 1896, Lenin travelled to Siberian exile in an ordinary third-class passenger car with three people all around him and shouted to the train crew that it was intolerably crowded. The painting by Yaroshenko, which everyone knows, Life is Everywhere, shows a fourth-class passenger car re-equipped in very naive fashion for prisoner transport. Everything has been left just as it was, and the prisoners are travelling just like ordinary people, except that double gratings have been installed on the windows. Cars of this type were used on Russian railroads for a very long time, and certain people remember being transported as prisoners in just such cars in 1927, except that the men and women were separated. On the other hand, the S.R. Trushin recalls that even during Tsarist times, he was transported as a prisoner in a Stolypin car, except that, once again going back to legendary times, there were six people in a compartment. Probably this type of railroad car really was first used under Stolypin, in other words, before 1911, and in the general cadet revolutionary embitterment, they christened it with his name. However, it really became the favourite means of prisoner transport only in the 20s, and it became the universal and exclusive means only from 1930 on, when everything in our life became uniform. Therefore, it would be more correct to call it a Stalin car rather than a Stolypin car. But we aren't going to argue with the Russian language here. The Stolypin car is an ordinary passenger car divided into compartments, except that five of the nine compartments are allotted to the prisoners. Here, as everywhere in the archipelago, half of everything goes to the auxiliary personnel, the guards. And compartments are separated from the corridor, not by a solid barrier, but by a grating, which leaves them open for inspection. This grating consists of intersecting diagonal bars like the kind one sees in station parks. It rises the full height of the car, and because of it, there are not the usual baggage racks projecting from the compartments over the corridor. The windows on the corridor sides are ordinary windows, but they have the same diagonal gratings on the outside. There are no windows in the prisoners' compartments, only tiny barred blinds on the level of the second sleeping shelves. That's why the car has no exterior windows and looks like a baggage car. The door into each compartment is a sliding door, an iron frame with bars. From the corridor side, all this is very reminiscent of a menagerie. Pitiful creatures resembling human beings are huddled there in cages, the floors and bunks surrounded on all sides by metal grills, looking out at you pitifully, begging for something to eat and drink, except that in menageries they never crowd the wild animals in so tightly. According to the calculations of non-prisoner engineers, Six people can sit on the bottom bunks of a Stolypin compartment, and another three can lie on the middle ones, which are joined in one continuous bunk, except for the space cut out beside the door for climbing up and getting down. And two more can lie on the baggage shelves above. Now, if, in addition to these eleven, eleven more are pushed into the compartment, the last of whom are shoved out of the way of the door by the jailer's boots as they shut it, then this will constitute a normal complement for a Stolypin prisoner's compartment. Two huddle, half sitting on each of the upper baggage shelves, another five lie on the joined middle level, and they are the lucky ones. These places are won in battle, and if there are any prisoners present from the underworld companionship of thieves, the Blatnier, then it is they who are lying there. And this leaves thirteen down below. Five sit on each of the bunks, and three are in the aisle between their legs. Somewhere, mixed up with the people, on the people, and under the people, are their belongings. And that is how they sit, their crossed legs wedged beneath them day after day. No, it isn't done especially to torture people. A sentenced prisoner is a labouring soldier of socialism, so why should he be tortured? They need him for construction work. But after all, you will agree he is not often a jaunt to visit his mother-in-law, and there's no reason in the world to treat him so well that people out in freedom would envy him. We have problems with our transportation. He'll get there all right, and he won't die on the way either. Since the 50s, when railroad timetables were actually straightened out, the prisoners haven't had to travel in this fashion for very long at a time, say, a day and a half or two days. During and after the war, things were worse. From Petropavlovsk, 
in Kazakhstan to Karaganda, a Stolypin car might be seven days en route, with 25 people in a compartment. From Karaganda to Sverdlovsk, it could be eight days with up to 26 in a compartment. Even just going from Kribyshev to Chelyabinsk in August 1945, Susi travelled in a Stolypin car for several days, and their compartment held 35 people lying on top of one another, floundering, fighting. Does this perhaps satisfy those who are astonished and reproachful because people didn't fight? And in the autumn of 1946, N.V. Timofiev Fresovsky travelled from Petropavlovsk to Moscow in a compartment that had 36 people in it. For several days he hung, suspended between other human beings, and his legs did not touch the floor. Then they started to die off, and the guards hauled the corpses out from under their feet. Not right away, true, only on the second day. That way things became less crowded. The whole trip to Moscow continued in this fashion for three weeks. When he got to Moscow, a miracle took place in accordance with the laws of the country of miracles. Officers carried Timofiev Rysovsky from the prisoner transport in their arms, and he was driven away in an ordinary automobile. He was off to advance science. Was 36 the upper limit for a Stolypin compartment? I have no evidence available on 37 or higher, and yet, adhering to our one and only scientific method, and remembering the necessity to struggle against the limiters, we are compelled to reply, no, 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 it is not a limit. Perhaps in some other country it would be an upper limit, but not here, as long as there are any cubic centimetres of unbreathed air left in the compartment, even if it be beneath the upper shelves, even if between shoulders, legs and heads, the compartment is ready to take additional prisoners. One might, however, conditionally accept as the upper limit the number of unremoved corpses which can be contained in the total volume of the compartment, given the possibility of packing them in at leisure. V. A. Korneyeva travelled from Moscow in a compartment that held 30 women, most of them withered old women exiled for their religious beliefs. On arrival, all these women, except two, were immediately put in the hospital. Nobody died in the compartment because several of the prisoners were young, well-developed, good-looking girls arrested for going out with foreigners. These girls took it upon themselves to shame the convoy. You ought to be ashamed to transport them this way. These are your own mothers. It probably wasn't so much their moral argument as their attractive appearance, which produced a reaction in the convoy guards, and they did move several of the old women out to the punishment cell. But the punishment cell in a stolly pin car is no punishment. It is a blessing. Of five prisoner compartments, four are used as general cells, and the fifth is set aside and divided in two halves. Two narrow half compartments, with one lower and one upper berth, like those the conductors have. These punishment cells serve to isolate prisoners. Three or four travel in them at a time, and this gives both comfort and space. No, it is not intentionally to torture them with thirst that the exhausted and overcrowded prisoners are fed not soup, but salt herring or dry smoked Caspian carp for the whole of their trip in the Stolypin car. This was exactly how it was in all the years, the thirties and the fifties, winter and summer, in Siberia and the Ukraine, and it isn't even necessary to cite examples. It was not to torture them with thirst, but just you tell me what these ragamuffins were to be fed anyway while being moved around. They were not supposed to get hot meals in prisoner transport railroad cars. True, there was a kitchen in one of the Stolypin car compartments, but that was only for the convoy. You couldn't just give the prisoners raw grits, and you couldn't give them raw codfish either, nor could you give them canned meat because they might stuff themselves. Herring was just the thing, with a piece of bread. And what else did they need? Go ahead, take your half a herring while they're handing it out, and be glad you got it. If you're smart, you aren't going to eat that herring. Just be patient, wait, hide it in your pocket, and you can eat it at the next transit point when there is water to be had. It's worse when they issue wet sea of Azov anchovies covered with coarse salt. You can't keep them in your pocket, so scoop them up in the flaps of your pea jacket or in your handkerchief in the palm of your hand and eat them. They divide up these Azov anchovies on somebody's pea jacket, whereas the convoy guards dump the dried carp right on the floor of the compartment, and it is divided up on the benches on the prisoners' knees. P. 
P.F. Yakubovich, in The World of the Outcasts, Volume 1, Moscow, 1964, writing about the 90s of the last century, recounts that in those terrible years they gave out ten kopecks a day mess money per person in Siberian prisoner transport when the price of a loaf of wheat bread, weighing ten and a half ounces, was five kopecks, a pot of milk, two quarts, three kopecks. The prisoners were simply in clover, he writes. But then, in Irkutsk province, the prices were higher. A pound of meat cost ten kopecks there, and the prisoners were simply famished. One pound of meat per day per person. It's not half a herring, is it? But once they've given you a fish, they aren't going to hold back on the bread, and maybe they'll even throw in a bit of sugar. Things are much worse when the convoy comes over and announces, We aren't going to be feeding you today. Nothing was issued for you. And it could very well be that nothing was actually issued. Someone in one or another prison accounting office made a mistake in the figures. And it could also be that it was issued, but that the convoy was short on rations. After all, they aren't exactly overfed either. And so they decided to snag a bit of your bread for themselves. And in that case, to hand over half a herring by itself would seem suspicious. And, of course, it is not for the purpose of intentionally torturing the prisoner that after his herring he is given neither hot water, and he never gets that here in any case, nor even plain unboiled water. One has to understand the situation. The convoy staff is limited. Some of them have to be on watch in the corridor. Some are on duty on the platform. At the stations they clamber all over the car, under it, on top of it, to make sure that there aren't any holes in it. Others are kept busy cleaning guns, and then, of course, there has to be time for political indoctrination and their catechism on the articles of war. And the third shift is sleeping. They insist on their full eight hours, for after all, the war is over. And then, to go carry water in pails, it has to be hauled a long way, too, and it's insulting. Why should a Soviet soldier have to carry water like a donkey for enemies of the people? And there are also times when they spend half a day hauling the Stolypin cars way out from the station in order to reshuffle or recouple the cars. It will be farther away from prying eyes. And the result is that you can't get water even for your own Red Army mess. True, there is one way out. You can go dip up some water from the locomotive tender. It's yellow and murky with some lubricating grease mixed in with it. But the Zex will drink it willingly. It doesn't really matter that much anyway since it isn't as if they could see what they are drinking in the semi-darkness of their compartment. They don't have their own window, and there isn't any light bulb there either, and what light they get comes from the corridor. And there's another thing, too. It takes a long time to dole out that water. The Zex don't have their own mugs. Whoever did have one has had it taken away from him. So what it adds up to is that they have to be given the two government-issue mugs to drink out of, and while they're drinking up, you have to keep standing there and standing and dipping it out and dipping it out some more and handing it to them. Yes, and then, too, the prisoners argue about who's to drink first. They want the healthy prisoners to drink first, and only then those with tuberculosis, and last of all, those with syphilis. Just as if it wasn't going to begin all over again in the next cell. First, the healthy ones. But the convoy could have borne with all that, hauled the water, and doled it out. If only those pigs, after slurping up the water, didn't ask to go to the toilet. So here's the way it all works out. If you don't give them water for a day, then they don't ask to go to the toilet. Give them water once, and they go to the toilet once. Take pity on them and give them water twice, and they go to the toilet twice. So it's pure and simple common sense. Just don't give them anything to drink. And it isn't that one is stingy about taking them to the toilet because one wants to be stingy about the use of the toilet itself, but because taking prisoners to the toilet is a responsible, even one might say a combat operation. It takes a long, long time for one private first class and two privates. Two guards have to be stationed, one next to the toilet door, the other in the corridor on the opposite side, so that no one tries to escape in that direction while the private first class has to push open and then shut the door to the compartment, first to admit the returning prisoner, and then to allow the next one out. The statutes permit letting out only one at a time, so that they don't try to escape, and so that they can't start a rebellion. Therefore, the way it works out is that the one prisoner who has been let out to go to the toilet is holding up 30 others in his own compartment, 
and 120 in the whole car, not to mention the convoy detail. And so the command resounds, Come on there, come on, get a move on, get a move on. The private first class and the soldiers keep hurrying him all the way there and back, and he hurries so fast that he stumbles, and it's as though they think he is going to steal that shithole from the state. In 1949, travelling in a Stolypin car between Moscow and Kribyshev, the one-legged German, Schultz, having understood the Russian hurry-up by this time, jumped to the toilet and back on his one leg, while the convoy kept laughing and ordering him to go faster. During one such trip, one of the convoy guards pushed him when he reached the platform at the end of the corridor, and Schultz fell down on the floor in front of the toilet. The convoy guard went into a rage and began to beat him, while Schultz, who couldn't get up because of the blows raining down on him, crawled and crept into the dirty toilet. The rest of the convoy roared with laughter. This, it seems, is what is meant by the phrase, Stalin's cult of personality. So that the prisoner shouldn't attempt to escape during the moment he was in the toilet, and also for a faster turnaround, the door to the toilet was not closed, and the convoy guard, watching the process from the platform of the car, could encourage it. Come on, come on now, that's plenty, that's enough for you. Sometimes the orders came before you even started. All right, number one only. And that meant that from the platform they'd prevent you doing anything else. And then, of course, you couldn't wash your hands. There was never enough water in the tank there, and there wasn't enough time either. If the prisoner even so much as touched the plunger of the washstand, the convoy guard would roar, Don't you touch that! Move along! And if someone happened to have soap or a towel among his belongings, he wouldn't dare take it out anyway, simply out of shame. That would really be acting like a sucker. The toilet was filthy. Quicker! Quicker! And tracking back the liquid mess on his shoes, the prisoner would be shoved back into the compartment, where he would climb up over somebody's arms and shoulders, and then from the top row his dirty shoes would dangle to the middle row and drip. When women were taken to the toilet, the statutes of the convoy service, and common sense as well, required that the toilet door be kept open, but not every convoy insisted on this, and some allowed the door to be shut. Oh, all right, go ahead and shut it. Later on, one of the women was sent in to wash out the toilet, and the guard again had to stand right there beside her so that she didn't try to escape. And even at this fast tempo, visits to the toilet for 120 people would take more than two hours, more than a quarter of the entire shift for three convoy guards. And in spite of that, you still couldn't make them happy. In spite of that, some old sandpiper or other would begin to cry half an hour later and ask to go to the toilet, and of course he wouldn't be allowed to go, and then he would soil himself right there in the compartment, and once again that meant trouble for the private first class. The prisoner had to be forced to pick it up in his hands and carry it away. So, that was all there was to it. Fewer trips to the toilet. And that meant less water and less food, too, because then they wouldn't complain of loose bowels and stink up the air. After all, how bad could it be? A man couldn't even breathe. Less water. But they had to hand out the herring anyway, just as the regulations required. No water. That was a reasonable measure. No herring. That was a service crime. No one, no one at all, ever set out to torture us on purpose. The convoy's actions were quite reasonable. But like the ancient Christians, we sat there in the cage while they poured salt on our raw and bleeding tongues. Also, the prisoner transport convoys did not often deliberately, though sometimes they did, mix the thieves, blatari, and non-political offenders in with Article 58 politicals in the same compartment. But a particular situation existed. There were a great many prisoners and very few railroad cars and compartments, and time was always short. And so when was there time enough to sort them out? One of the four compartments was kept for women, and if the prisoners in the other three were to be sorted out on one basis or another... The most logical basis would be by destination, so that it would be easier to unload them. After all, was it because Pontius Pilate wanted to humiliate him that Christ was crucified between two thieves? It just happened to be crucifixion day that day, and there was only one Golgotha, and time was short. And so he was numbered with the transgressors. I am afraid even to think what I would have had to suffer if I had been in the position of a common convict. 
The convoy and the transport officers dealt with me and my comrades with cautious politeness. Being a political, I went to hard labor in relative comfort. On the transports, I had quarters separate from the criminal prisoners, and my pood, my 36 pounds of baggage, was moved about on a cart. I left out the quotation marks around the above paragraph to enable the reader to understand things a little better. After all, quotation marks are always used either for irony or to set something apart. And without quotation marks, the paragraph sounds wild, does it not? It was written by P.F. Yakubovich about the 90s of the last century. His book was recently republished as a sermon on that dark and dismal age. We learn from it that even on a barge, the political prisoners had special quarters and a special section set aside for their walks on deck. The same thing appears in Tolstoy's Resurrection, in which, furthermore, an outsider, Prince Nekhyodov, is allowed to visit the political prisoners in order to interview them. And it was only because the magic word political had been left out by mistake, opposite Yakubovich's name on the list, his own words, that he was met at Ustkara by the hard labor inspector, like an ordinary criminal prisoner, rudely, provocatively, impudently. However, this misunderstanding was all happily cleared up. What an unbelievable time. It was almost a crime to mix politicals with criminals. Criminals were teamed up and driven along the streets to the station so as to expose them to public disgrace. And politicals could go there in carriages. Olminsky in 1899. Politicals were not fed from the common pot, but were given a food allowance instead and had their meals brought from public eating houses. The Bolshevik Olminsky didn't want even the hospital rations because he found the food too coarse. Because of all of this, the ordinary criminal mob christened the professional revolutionaries mangy swells. P.F. Yakubovich. The Butyrki prison superintendent apologized to Olminsky for the jailers having addressed him too familiarly. You see, we seldom get politicals here, and the jailer didn't know any better. Seldom get politicals in the Butyrki? What kind of dream is this? Then where were they? The Lubyanka didn't exist as a prison at the time, and neither did Lefortovo. The writer Radishchev was taken to the prisoner transport in shackles, and when the weather got cold, they threw over him a repulsive, raw sheepskin coat, which they had taken from a watchman. However, the Empress Catherine immediately issued orders that his shackles be removed and that he be provided with everything he required for his journey. But in November 1927... Anna Skrednikova was sent on a transport from the Butyrki to the Solovetsky Islands in a straw hat and a summer dress. That was what she had been wearing when she was arrested in the summer, and since that time her room had been sealed, and no one was willing to give her permission to get her winter things out of it. To draw a distinction between political prisoners and common criminals is the equivalent of showing them respect as equal opponents, of recognizing that people may have views of their own, Thus, a political prisoner is conscious of political freedom, even when under arrest. But since the time when we all became K.R.s and the socialists failed to retain their status as politicals, since then any protest that as a political you ought not to be mixed up with ordinary criminals has resulted only in laughter on the prisoner's part and bewilderment on the part of the jailers. All are criminals here, the jailers reply, sincerely. This mingling, this first devastating encounter, takes place either in the Black Maria or in the Stolypin car. Up to this moment, no matter how they have oppressed, tortured and tormented you during the interrogation, it has all originated with the blue caps, and you have never confused them with human beings, but have seen in them merely an insolent branch of the service. But at the same time, even if your cellmates have been totally different from you in development and experience, and even if you have quarrelled with them, and even if they have squealed on you, they have all belonged to that same ordinary, sinful, everyday humanity among which you have spent your whole life. When you were jammed into a Stolypin compartment, you expected that here, too, you would encounter only colleagues in misfortune. All your enemies and oppressors remained on the other side of the bars, and you certainly did not expect to find them on this side. And suddenly you lift your eyes to the square recess in the middle bunk, to that one and only heaven above you, and up there you see three or four, oh no, not faces, 
They aren't monkey muzzles either, because monkeys' muzzles are much, much decenter and more thoughtful. No, and they aren't simply hideous countenances, since there must be something human even in them. You see cruel, loathsome snouts up there, wearing expressions of greed and mockery. Each of them looks at you like a spider gloating over a fly. Their web is that grating which imprisons you, and you have been had. They squinch up their lips, as if they intend to bite you from one side. They hiss when they speak, enjoying that hissing more than the vowel and consonant sounds of speech. And the only thing about their speech that resembles the Russian language is the endings of verbs and nouns. It is gibberish. Those strange gorilloids were usually dressed in sleeveless undershirts. After all, it is stuffy in the Stolypin car. Their sinewy purple necks, their swelling shoulder muscles, their swarthy tattooed chests have never suffered prison emaciation. Who are they? Where do they come from? And suddenly you see a small cross dangling from one of those necks. Yes, a little aluminum cross on a string. You are surprised and slightly relieved. That means there are religious believers among them. How touching. So nothing terrible is going to happen. But immediately this believer belies both his cross and his faith by cursing, and they curse partly in Russian, and he jabs two protruding fingers spread into the V of a slingshot right in your eyes, not even pausing to threaten you, but starting to punch them out then and there. And this gesture of theirs, which says, I'll gouge out your eyes, crowbait, covers their entire philosophy and faith. If they are capable of crushing your eyeballs like worms, what is there on you or belonging to you that they'll spare? The little cross dangles there, and your still unsquashed eyes watch this wildest of masquerades, and your whole system of reckoning goes awry. Which of you is already crazy, and who is about to go insane? In one moment, all the customs and habits of human intercourse you have lived with all your life have broken down. In your entire previous life, particularly before your arrest, but even to some degree afterward, even to some degree during interrogation, too, you spoke words to other people and they answered you in words, and those words produced actions. One might persuade or refuse or come to an agreement. You recall various human relationships, a request, an order an expression of gratitude. But what has overtaken you here is beyond all these words and beyond all these relationships. An emissary of the ugly snout descends, most often a vicious boy whose impudence and rudeness are thrice despicable, and this little demon unties your bag and rifles your pockets, not tentatively, but treating them like his very own. From that moment, nothing that belongs to you is yours any longer. And all you yourself are is a rubber dummy around which superfluous things are wrapped, which can easily be taken off. Nor can you explain anything in words, nor deny, nor prohibit, nor plead with that evil little skunk or those foul snouts up above. They are not people. This has become clear to you in one moment. The only thing to be done with them is to beat them, to beat them without wasting any time flapping your tongue either that juvenile there or those bigger vermin up above. But how can you hit those three up top from down below? And the kid there, even though he's a stinking polecat, well, it doesn't seem right to hit him either. Maybe you can push him away, soft-like. No, you can't even do that because he'll bite your nose right off or else they'll break your head from above. And they have knives too, but they aren't going to bother to pull them out and soil them on you. You look at your neighbours, your comrades, Let's either resist or protest. But all your comrades, all your fellow Article 58s, who have been plundered one by one even before you got there, sit there submissively, hunched over, and they stare right past you. And it's even worse when they look at you the way they always do look at you, as though no violence were going on at all, no plundering, as though it were a natural phenomenon, as though it were the grass growing and the rain falling. And the reason why, gentlemen, comrades, and brothers, is that the proper time was allowed to slip by. You ought to have got hold of yourselves and remembered who you were back when Strzinski burned himself alive in the Vyatka cell, and even before that, when you were declared counter-revolutionaries. And so, 
You allow the thieves to take your overcoat and pour through your jacket and snatch your twenty roubles from where it was sewn in, and your bag has already been tossed up above and checked out, and everything your sentimental wife collected for your long trip after you were sentenced stays up there, and they've thrown the bag back down to you with your toothbrush. Although not everyone submitted just like that, ninety-nine percent did in the thirties and forties. I have heard of a few cases in which three seasoned, young, and healthy men stood up against the thieves, not to defend justice in general, but to protect not those who were being plundered right next to them, but themselves only. In other words, armed neutrality. And how could that be? Men, officers, soldiers. Frontline soldiers. To strike out boldly, a person has to be ready for that battle, waiting for it, and has to understand its purpose. All these conditions were absent here. A person wholly unfamiliar with the thieves, the Blatnoy milieu, didn't anticipate this battle, and most importantly, failed totally to understand its vital necessity. Up to this point, he had assumed incorrectly that his only enemies were the blue caps. He needed still more education to arrive at the understanding that the tattooed chests were merely the rear ends of the blue caps. This was the revelation that blue caps never utter aloud: "You today, me tomorrow." The new prisoner wanted to consider himself a political, in other words, on the side of the people, while the state was against the people. And at that point, he was unexpectedly assaulted from behind and both sides by quick-fingered devils of some kind, and all the categories got mixed up, and clarity was shattered into fragments. And it would take a long time for the prisoner to put two and two together and figure out that this horde of devils were hand in glove with the jailers. To strike out boldly, a person has to feel that his rear is defended. That he has support on both his flanks, that there is solid earth beneath his feet. All these conditions were absent for the Article Fifty Eight. Having passed through the meat grinder of political interrogation, the human being was physically crushed in body. He had been starved. He hadn't slept. He had frozen in punishment cells. He had lain there a beaten man. But it wasn't only his body. His soul was crushed too. Over and over, he had been told and had had demonstrated to him that his views and his conduct in life and his relationships with people had all been wrong because they had brought him to ruin. All that was left in that scrunched-up ward, the engine room of the law, had spewed out into the prisoner transport, was a greed for life, and no understanding whatever. To crush him once and for all, and to cut him off from all others once and for all, that. Was the function of interrogation under Article Fifty Eight? The convicted prisoner had to learn that his worst guilt out in freedom had been his attempt somehow to get together or unite with others by any route but the party organizer, the trade union organizer, or the administration. In prison, this fear went so far as to become fear of all kinds of collective action. Two voices uttering the same complaint, or two prisoners signing a complaint on one piece of paper. Gun shy now, and for a good long time to come, of any and every kind of collaboration or unification, the pseudo politicals were not prepared to unite, even against the thieves. Nor would they even think of bringing along a weapon, a knife, or a bludgeon for the Stolypin car or the transit prison. In the first place, why have one? And against whom? In the second place, if you did use it, then considering the aggravating circumstance of your malevolent Article Fifty Eight, you might be shot when you were retried. In the third place, even before that, your punishment for having a knife when they searched you would be very different from the thief's. For him to have a knife was mere misbehaviour, tradition. He didn't know any better. But for you to have one was terrorism. Finally, many of the people imprisoned under Article Fifty Eight were peaceful people, very often elderly too, and often ill, and they had gotten along all their lives with words and without resorting to fisticuffs, and they weren't any more prepared for them now than they had been before. 
Nor had the thieves ever been put through the same kind of interrogation. Their entire interrogation had consisted of two sessions, an easy trial and an easy sentence, and they wouldn't have to serve it out. They would be released ahead of time. Either they would be amnested, or else they would simply escape. V.I. Ivanov, now from Ukhta, got Article 162, thievery, nine times, and Article 82, escape, five times, for a total of 37 years in prison, and he served out five to six years for all of them. Even during interrogation, no one ever deprived a thief of his legitimate parcels, consisting of abundant packages from the loot kept by his underworld comrades who were still on the loose. He never grew thin, was never weak for a single day, and in transit he ate at the expense of the innocent non-thieves, whom he called, in his own jargon, the friera, freyers, or innocents, or suckers. Freya is a blatnoi, underworld word, meaning non-thief. In other words, not a chelovek, human being with a capital letter. Well, even more simply, the Friera were all non-thief, non-underworld mankind. Not only did the articles of the code dealing with thieves and bandits not oppress the thief, he was, in fact, proud of his convictions under them. And he was supported in this pride by all the chiefs in blue shoulder boards and blue piping. Oh, that's nothing. Even though you're a bandit and a murderer, you are not a traitor of the motherland. You are one of our own people. You will reform. There was no Section 11 for organization. In the thieves article in the code, organization was not forbidden the thieves. And why should it be? Let it help develop in them the feelings of collectivism that people in our society need so badly. And disarming them was just a game. They weren't punished for having a weapon. Their thieves' law was respected. They can't be anything but what they are. And a new murder in the cell would not increase a murderer's sentence, but instead would bring him new laurels. And all that went very deep indeed. In works of the last century, the lumpen proletariat was criticized for little more than a certain lack of discipline, for fickleness of mood. And Stalin was always partial to the thieves. After all, who robbed the banks for him? Back in 1901, his comrades in the party and in prison accused him of using common criminals against his political enemies. From the twenties on, the obliging term social ally came to be widely used. That was Makarenko's contention, too. These could be reformed. According to Makarenko, the origin of crime lay solely in the counter-revolutionary underground. Those were the ones who couldn't be reformed. Engineers, priests, SRs, Mensheviks. And why shouldn't they steal if there was no one to put a stop to it? Three or four brazen thieves working hand in glove could lord it over several dozen frightened and cowed pseudo-politicals. With the approval of the administration, on the basis of the progressive doctrine. But even if they didn't drive off the thieves with their fists, why didn't the victims at least make complaints? After all, every sound could be heard in the corridor, and a convoy guard was marching slowly back and forth right out there. Yes, that is a question. Every sound and every complaining cry can be heard, and the convoy just keeps marching back and forth. Why doesn't he interfere? Just a yard away from him, in the half-dark cave of the compartment, they are plundering a human being. Why doesn't the soldier of the government police interfere? For the very same reason. He, too, has been indoctrinated. Even more than that, after many years of favoring thieves, the convoy has itself slipped in their direction. The convoy has itself become a thief. From the middle of the thirties until the middle of the forties, during that ten-year period of the thieves' most flagrant debauches and most intense oppression of the politicals, no one at all can recall a case in which a convoy guard intervened in the plundering of a political in a cell, in a railroad car, or in a black maria. But they will tell you of innumerable cases in which the convoy accepted stolen goods from the thieves, and in return bought them vodka, snacks, 
sweeter than the rations, too, and smokes. The examples are so numerous as to be typical. The convoy sergeant, after all, hasn't anything either. He has his gun, his greatcoat roll, his mess tin, his soldier's ration. It would be cruel to require him to escort an enemy of the people in an expensive overcoat or chrome leather boots or with a swag of luxurious city articles and to reconcile himself to that inequality. Was not taking these things just one additional form of the class struggle, after all? And what other norms were there? In 1945 to 1946, when prisoners streamed in, not just from anywhere but from Europe, and wore and had in their bags unheard-of European articles, even the convoy officers could not restrain themselves. Their service had kept them from the front, but at the end of the war it also kept them from the harvest of booty. And I ask you, was that just? And so, in these circumstances, the convoy guard systematically mixed the thieves and the politicals in each compartment of their stolypin, not through lack of space for them elsewhere, and not through haste, but out of greed. And the thieves did not let them down. They stripped the beavers of everything, and then those possessions migrated into the suitcases of the convoy. A beaver, in the Blatnoy, underworld, jargon, was any rich zek who had trash, meaning good clothes, and basili, meaning fats, sugar, and other goodies. But what could be done if the beavers had been loaded into the Stolypin cars and the train was moving and there simply weren't any thieves at all? They simply hadn't put any aboard. What if they weren't being shipped out on prisoner transports that day, even from one of the stations along the way? This could and did happen. Several such cases are known. In 1947, they were transporting from Moscow to the Vladimir Central Prison a group of foreigners who had opulent possessions as could be seen the very first time their suitcases were opened. At that point, the convoy itself began a systematic confiscation of their belongings right there in the railroad car. So that nothing should be missed, the prisoners were forced to undress down to their bare skin and to sit on the floor of the car near the toilet while their things were examined and taken away. But the convoy guard failed to take into account that they were taking these prisoners not to a camp, but to a genuine prison. On their arrival there, I.A. Korneyev handed in a written complaint describing exactly what had happened. They found the particular unit of convoy guards and searched them. Some of the things were recovered and returned to their owners, who also received compensation in money for those that weren't recovered. They say that the convoy guards got from 10 to 15 years. However, this is something that cannot be checked. And anyway, they would have been convicted under an ordinary non-political article of the code, and they wouldn't have had to spend a long time in prison. However, that was an exceptional case, and if he had managed to restrain his greed in time, the chief of the convoy would have realized that it was better not to get involved in it. And here is another, less complicated case, which probably means that it happened often. In August 1945, in the Moscow Novosibirsk Stolypin car, in which A. Susi was being transported, it turned out that there weren't any thieves, and the trip was a long one, and the Stolypins just crawled along at that time. Without hurrying in the least, all in good time, the convoy chief declared a search, one prisoner at a time in the corridor, with his things. Those summoned were made to undress in accordance with prison rules, but that wasn't why the search was being conducted, for each prisoner who had been searched was, in fact, put right back into his own crowded compartment, and any knife, anything forbidden, could simply have been passed from hand to hand. The real purpose of the search was to examine their personal articles, the clothes they were wearing, and whatever was in their bags. And right there, beside the bag, not in the least bored by the whole protracted search, the chief of the convoy guard... An officer stood with a haughty poker face, with his assistant, a sergeant, beside him. Sinful greed kept trying to pop out, but the officer kept it hidden under a pretended indifference. It was the same situation as an old rake looking over little girls, but embarrassed by the presence of outsiders. Yes, and by that of the girls, too. 
and not knowing exactly how to proceed. How badly he needed just a few thieves, but there were no thieves in the transport. There were no thieves aboard, but there were individuals among the prisoners who had already been infected by the thief-laden atmosphere of the prison. After all, the example of thieves is instructive and calls forth imitations. It demonstrates that there is an easy way to live in prison. Two recent officers were in one of the compartments, Sanin from the Navy and Mereshkov. They were both 58s, but their attitudes had already changed. Sanin, with Mereshkov's support, proclaimed himself the monitor of the compartment and, through a convoy guard, requested a meeting with their chief. He had fathomed that haughtiness and its need of a pimp. This was unheard of, but Sanin was summoned and they had a chat somewhere. Following Sanin's example, someone in the second compartment also asked for a meeting, and that person was similarly received. And the next morning they issued not twenty ounces of bread, the prisoner transport ration at the time, but no more than nine ounces. They gave out the ration, and a quiet murmur began. A murmur, but in fear of any collective action, these politicals did not speak up. In the event... Only one among them loudly asked the guard distributing the bread, Citizen Chief, how much does this ration weigh? The correct weight, he was told. I demand a re-weighing, otherwise I will not accept it, the dissatisfied prisoner declared loudly. The whole car fell silent. Many waited before beginning to eat their ration, expecting that theirs too would be re-weighed. And at that moment, in all his spotlessness, the officer appeared. Everyone fell silent, which made his words all the weightier and all the more irresistible. Which one here spoke out against the Soviet government? All hearts stopped beating. People will protest that this is a universal approach that even out in freedom every little chief declares himself to be the Soviet government and just try to argue with him about it. But for those who are panicky who have just been sentenced for anti-Soviet propaganda, the threat is more frightening. Who is starting a mutiny over the bread ration? The officer demanded. Citizen Lieutenant, I only wanted... The guilty rebel was already trying to explain it all away. Aha, you're the bastard. You're the one who doesn't like the Soviet government. And why rebel? Why argue? Wasn't it really easier to eat that little underweight ration, to suffer it in silence? And now he had fallen right in it. You stinking shit, you counter-revolutionary, you ought to be hanged and you have the nerve to demand that the bread ration be reweighed. You rat, the Soviet government gives you food and drink and you have the brass to be dissatisfied. Do you know what you're going to get for that? Orders to the guard. Take him out. The lock rattles. Come on out, you. Hands behind your back. They bring out the unfortunate. Now, who else is dissatisfied? Who else wants his bread ration reweighed? And it's not as if you could prove anything anyway. It's not as if they'd take your word against the lieutenants if you were to complain somewhere that there were only nine ounces instead of twenty. It's quite enough to show a well-beaten dog the whip. All the rest turned out to be satisfied and that was how the penalty ration was confirmed for all the days of the long journey. And they began to withhold the sugar, too. The convoy had appropriated it. And this took place during the summer of our two great victories over Germany and Japan, victories which embellish the history of our fatherland and which our grandsons and great-grandsons will learn about in school. The prisoners went hungry for a day, and then a second day, by which time several of them began to get a bit wiser, and Sonin said to his compartment, Look, fellows, if we go on this way, we're lost. Come on now, all of you who have some good stuff with you, let me have it, and I'll trade it for something to eat. With great self-assurance, he accepted some articles and turned down others. Not all the prisoners were willing to let their things go, and, you see, no one forced them to either. And then he and Mereshkov asked to be allowed to leave the compartment, and strangely enough, the convoy let them out. Taking the thing as they went off toward the compartment of the convoy guard, and they returned from there with sliced loaves of bread and with makhorka. 
These very loaves constituted the eleven ounces missing from the daily rations. Now, however, they were not distributed on an equal basis, but went only to those who had handed over their belongings. And that was quite fair. After all, they had all admitted they were satisfied with the reduced bread ration. It was also fair because the belongings were, after all, worth something, and it was right that they should be paid for. And it was also fair in the long view because those things were simply too good for camp and were destined anyway to be taken away or stolen there. The Makorka had belonged to the guard. The soldiers shared their precious Makorka with the prisoners, and that was fair too since they had eaten the prisoners' bread and drunk up their sugar, which was too good for enemies anyway. And last, it was only fair too that Sunin and Mereshkov took the largest share for themselves even though they'd contributed nothing, because without them all this would not have been arranged. And so they sat, crammed in there, in the semi-darkness, and some of them chewed on their neighbors' chunks of bread, and their neighbors sat there and watched them. The guard permitted smoking only on a collective basis every two hours, and the whole car was as filled with smoke as if there'd been a fire. Those who at first had clung to their things now regretted that they hadn't given them to Sanin and asked him to take them, but Sanin said he'd only take them later on. This whole operation wouldn't have worked so well and so thoroughly had it not been for the slow trains and slow stolypin cars of the immediate post-war years, when they kept unhitching them from one train and hitching them to another and held them waiting in the stations. And, at the same time, if it hadn't been the immediate post-war period, Neither would there have been those greed-inspiring belongings. Their train took a week to get to Kuibyshev, and during that entire week they got only nine ounces of bread a day. This, to be sure, was twice the ration distributed during the siege of Leningrad. And they did get dried Caspian carp and water in addition. They had to ransom their remaining bread ration with their personal possessions. And soon the supply of these articles exceeded the demand, and the convoy guards became very choosy and reluctant to take more things. They were received at the Kwebyshev Transit Prison, given baths, and returned as a group to that very same Stolypin. The convoy which took them over was new, but in passing on the relay baton, the previous crew had evidently told them how to put the squeeze on, and the very same system of ransoming their own rations functioned all the way to Novosibirsk. It is easy to see how this infectious experiment might have spread rapidly through whole units of the convoy guards. And when they were unloaded on the ground between the tracks in Novosibirsk, some new officer came up and asked them, Any complaints against the convoy? And they were all so confused that nobody answered. The first chief of convoy had calculated accurately, This was Russia. Another factor which distinguishes Stolypin passengers from the rest of the train is that they do not know where their train is going and at what station they will disembark. After all, they don't have tickets and they don't read the route signs on the cars. In Moscow, they sometimes load them on so far from the station platform that even the Muscovites among them don't know which of the eight Moscow stations they are at. For several hours, the prisoners sit all squeezed together in the stench while they wait for a switching engine. And finally it comes and takes the Zack car to the already made-up train. If it is summertime, the station loudspeakers can be heard. Moscow to Ufa, departing from track three. Moscow to Tashkent, still loading at platform one. That means it's the Kazan station, and those who know the geography of the archipelago are now explaining to their comrades that Vorkuta and Pechora are out. They leave from the Yaroslavl station and the Kirov and Gorky camps are out, too. Thus it is that weeds get into the harvest of fame. But are they weeds? After all, there are no Pushkin, Gogol, or Tolstoy camps. But there are Gorky camps, and what a nest of them, too. Yes, and there is a separate mine named for Maxim Gorky, twenty-five miles from Elgen in the Kolyma. Yes, Alexei Maximovich Gorky... With your heart and your name, comrade, 
If the enemy does not surrender, you say one reckless little word, and look, you're not in literature any longer. They never send people from Moscow to Biola, Russia, the Ukraine, or the Caucasus anyway. They have no room there even for their own. Let's listen some more. The Ufa train has left, and ours hasn't moved. The Tashkent train has started, and we're still here. Moscow to Novosibirsk, departing. All those seeing passengers off, disembark. All passengers show their tickets. We have started. Our train. And what does that prove? Nothing so far. The middle Volga area is still open, and the South Urals. And Kazakhstan, with the Jezkazgan copper mines. And Taishet, with its factory for creosoting railroad ties where they say creosote penetrates the skin and bones and its vapors fills the lungs, and that is death. All Siberia is still open to us, all the way to Sovetskaya Gavan, the Kolyma too, and Norilsk. And if it is winter time, the car is battened down and the loudspeakers are inaudible. If the convoy guards obey their regulations, then you'll hear nary a whisper from them about the route either. And thus... We set out, and, entangled in other bodies, fall asleep to the clacking of the wheels, without knowing whether we will see forest or step through the window tomorrow, through that window in the corridor, from the middle shelf, through the grating, the corridor, the two window panes, and still another grating, you can still see some switching tracks and a piece of open space hurtling by the train. If the window panes have not frosted over, you can sometimes even read the names of the stations some Avzionino or Undol. Where are these stations? No one in the compartment knows. Sometimes you can judge from the sun whether you are being taken north or east. Or at some place called Tufanovo, they might shove some dilapidated non-political offender into your compartment, and he would tell you he was being taken to Danilov to be tried and was scared he'd get a couple of years. In this way, you would find out that you'd gone through Yaroslavl that night, which meant that the first transit prison on your route would be Vologda. And some know-it-alls in the compartment would savour gloomily the famous flourish, stressing all the O's of the Vologda guards. The Vologda convoy guards don't joke. But even after figuring out the general direction, you still haven't really found out anything. Transit prisons lie in clusters on your route, and you can be shunted off to one side or another from any one of them. You don't fancy Uchta, nor Inta, nor Vorkuta. But do you think that Construction Project 501, a railroad in the tundra crossing northern Siberia, is any sweeter? It is worse than any of them. Five years after the war, when the waves of prisoners had finally settled within the river banks or perhaps they had merely expanded the MBD staffs. The ministry sorted out the millions of piles of cases and started sending along with each sentenced prisoner a sealed envelope that contained his case file, and visible through a slot in the envelope, his route and destination, inserted for the convoy, and the convoy wasn't supposed to know anything more than that, because the contents of the file might have a corrupting influence. So then... If you were lying on the middle bunk and the sergeant stopped right next to you and you could read upside down, you might be fast enough to read that someone was being taken to Kinyaj Pogost and that you were being sent to Kargopol. So now there would be more worries. What was Kargopol camp? Who had ever heard of it? What kind of general assignment work did they have there? There did exist general assignment work which was fatal and some that was not that bad. Was this a death camp or not? And then, how would you fail to let your family know in the hurry of leaving, and they thought you were still in the Stalinogorsk camp near Tula? If you were very nervous about this and very inventive, you might succeed in solving that problem, too. You might find someone with a piece of pencil lead half an inch long and a piece of crumpled paper. Making sure the convoy doesn't see you from the corridor, you are forbidden to lie with your feet toward the corridor, your head has to be in that direction. Hunched over and facing in the opposite direction, you write to your family between lurches of the car that you have suddenly been taken from where you were and are being sent somewhere else, and you might be able to send only one letter a year from your new destination 
so let them be prepared for this eventuality. You have to fold your letter into a triangle and carry it to the toilet in the hope of a lucky break. They might just take you there while approaching a station or just after passing a station, and the convoy guard on the car platform might get careless, and you can quickly press down on the flush pedal and, using your body as a shield, throw the letter into the hole. It will get wet and soiled, but it might fall right through and land between the rails, or it might even get through dry, and the draft beneath the car will catch and whirl it, and it would fall under the wheels or miss them and land on the downward slope of the embankment. Perhaps it will lie there until it rains, until it snows, until it disintegrates. But perhaps a human hand will pick it up. And if this person isn't a stickler for the party line, he will make the address legible. He will straighten out the letters, or perhaps put it in an envelope, and perhaps the letter will even reach its destination. Sometimes such letters do arrive: postage due, half blurred, washed out, crumpled. But carrying a clearly defined splash of grief. But it is better still to stop as soon as possible. Being a sucker, that ridiculous greenhorn, that prey, that victim, the chances are ninety-five out of a hundred that your letter won't get there. But even if it does, it will bring no happiness to your home, and you won't be measuring your life and breath by hours and days once you have entered this epic country. Arrivals and departures here are separated by decades, by a quarter century. You will never return to your former world, and the sooner you get used to being without your near and dear ones, and the sooner they get used to being without you, the better it will be, and the easier. And keep as few things as possible, so that you don't have to fear for them. Don't take a suitcase for the convoy guard to crush at the door of the car, when there are twenty-five people in a compartment. What else could he figure out to do with it? And don't wear new boots, and don't wear fashionable oxfords, and don't wear a woolen suit. These things are going to be stolen, taken away, swept aside, or switched, either in the Stolypin car, or in the Black Maria, or in the transit prison. Give them up without a struggle, because otherwise the humiliation will poison your heart. They will take them away from you in a fight, and trying to hold on to your property will only leave you with a bloodied mouth. All those brazen snouts, those jeering manners, those two-legged dregs, are repulsive to you. But by owning things and trembling about their fate, aren't you forfeiting the rare opportunity of observing and understanding? And do you think that the freebooters, the pirates, the great privateers? Painted in such lively colours by Kipling and Gumilyev, were not simply these same Blatanye, these same thieves. That's just what they were. Fascinating in romantic literary portraits. Why are they so repulsive to you here? Understand them too. To them, prison is their native home. No matter how fondly the government treats them, no matter how it softens their punishments. No matter how often it amnesties them, their inner destiny brings them back again and again. Was not the first word in the legislation of the archipelago for them? In our country, the right to own private property was at one time just as effectively banished out in freedom too. And then those who had banished it began to enjoy possessing things. So why should it be tolerated in prison? You were too slow about it. You didn't eat up your fat bacon. You didn't share your sugar and tobacco with your friends, and so now the thieves empty your bindle in order to correct your moral error. Having given you their pitiful, worn-out boots in exchange for your fashionable ones, their soiled coveralls in return for your sweater, they won't keep these things for long. Your boots were merely something to lose and win back five times at cards. And they'll hawk your sweater the very next day for a liter of vodka and a round of salami. They too will have nothing left of them in one day's time, just like you. This is the principle of the second law of thermodynamics: all differences tend to level out, to disappear. Own nothing, possess nothing. Buddha and Christ taught us this, and the Stoics and the Cynics. Greedy, though we are. Why can't we seem to grasp that simple teaching?
Can't we understand that with property we destroy our soul? So, let the herring keep warm in your pocket until you get to the transit prison, rather than beg for something to drink here. And did they give us a two-day supply of bread and sugar? In that case, eat it in one sitting. Then no one will steal it from you, and you won't have to worry about it. And you'll be free as a bird in heaven. Own only what you can always carry with you. No languages, no countries, no people. Let your memory be your travel bag. Use your memory. Use your memory. It is those bitter seeds alone which might sprout and grow some day. Look around you. There are people around you. Maybe you will remember one of them all your life and later eat your heart out because you didn't make use of the opportunity to ask him questions. And the less you talk, the more you'll hear. Thin strands of human lives stretch from island to island of the archipelago. They intertwine, touch one another for one night only in just such a clickety-clacking half-dark car as this, and then separate once and for all. Put your ear to their quiet humming and the steady clickety-clack beneath the car. After all, it is the spinning wheel of life that is clicking and clacking away there. What strange stories you can hear, what things you will laugh at. Now, that fast-moving little Frenchman over there near the grating, why does he keep twisting around? What is he so surprised at? Explain things to him, and you can ask him at the same time how he happened to land here. So you found someone who knows French, and you learn that he is Max Santerre, a French soldier, and he used to be just as alert and curious out in freedom in his douce France. They told him politely to stop hanging around the transit point for Russian repatriates, but he kept doing it anyway. And then the Russians invited him to have a drink with them. And from a certain moment after that, he remembers nothing. He came to on the floor of an airplane to find himself dressed in a Red Army man's field shirt and breeches, with the boots of a convoy guard looming over him. They told him he was sentenced to ten years in camp, but that, of course, as he very clearly understood, was just a nasty joke, wasn't it? And everything would be cleared up. Oh yes, it will be cleared up, dear fellow. Just wait. Ahead of him lay another sentence for twenty-five years. That he was given in camp, and he would not get out of Odzalag until 1957. Well, there was nothing to be surprised at in such cases in 1945 to 1946. That particular story was Franco-Russian, and here is one which is Russo-French. But no, really, just pure Russian, because no one but a Russian would play this kind of trick. Throughout our history, there have been people who just couldn't be contained, like Menshikov in Berezovo in Surikov's painting. Now, take Ivan Kovrachenko, average height, wiry, and yet he couldn't be contained either, because he was a stalwart fellow with a healthy countenance. But the devil threw in a bit of vodka for good measure. He would talk about himself quite willingly and laugh at himself too. Such stories as his are a treasure; they are meant to be heard. True, it took a long time to figure out why he had been arrested and why he was considered a political. But there's no real need to make a fetish of the category political either. Does it matter a damn what rake they haul you in with? As everyone knows very well, the Germans were preparing for chemical warfare, and we weren't. Therefore, it was most unfortunate that because of some dunderheads in the quartermaster's department, we left whole stacks of mustard gas bombs at a certain airdrome when we fled the Kuban, and the Germans could have turned this fact into an international scandal. At that point. Senior Lieutenant Kovarchenko, a native of Krasnodar, was assigned twenty parachutists and dropped behind the German lines to bury all those invidious bombs. Those hearing this story have already guessed how it ends, and are yawning. Next, he was taken prisoner, and he has now become a traitor of the motherland. Nothing at all like that. Kovarchenko carried out his assignment brilliantly and returned through the front with his entire complement of men, having lost not one. And was nominated to receive the order of hero of the Soviet Union, but it takes a month or two for the official nomination to be confirmed. And what if you can't be contained within that hero of the Soviet Union either? Heroes are awarded to quiet boys who are models of military and political preparedness. But what if your soul is a fire and you want to drink, and there isn't anything to drink? And why, if you are a hero of the whole union, are the rats being so stingy as to refuse you an extra liter of vodka? And Ivan Kovarchenko, 
mounted his horse, and even though it's true that he had never heard of Caligula, he rode his horse upstairs to the second floor to see the city's military commissar, the commandant. Come on now, issue me some vodka. He figured this would be more imposing, more in the style of a hero, and harder to turn down. Did they arrest him for that? No, of course not. But his award was reduced from hero to the Order of the Red Banner. Kovachenko had a large thirst, and vodka wasn't always available, and so he had to be inventive. In Poland, he had gone in and prevented the Germans from blowing up a certain bridge. And he got the feeling this bridge really belonged to him, and so, for the time being, before our commandant's headquarters arrived, he exacted payment from the Poles for crossing the bridge. After all, without me, you wouldn't have this bridge, you pests. He collected tolls for a whole day, for vodka, and then got bored with it and this wasn't in any case the place for him to stick around. So, Captain Kovachenko offered the nearby Poles his equitable solution that they buy the bridge from him. Was he arrested for this? No. He didn't ask very much for it, but the Poles protested and refused. Pan Captain abandoned the bridge. All right then, to hell with you, take your bridge and cross it for nothing. In 1949, he was chief of staff of a parachute regiment in Polotsk, Major Kovachenko was very much disliked by the political branch of the division because he had failed the political indoctrination course. He had once asked them to recommend him for admission to the military academy, but when they gave him the recommendation, he took one look at it and threw it back across the table at them. With that kind of recommendation, the place for me to go is not the academy, but the Bandorovtsi, the Ukrainian nationalist rebels. Was he arrested for that? He might very well have gotten a tenor for it, but he got away with it. At that point, on top of all the rest, it turned out that he had given one of his men an unwarranted leave, and then he himself drove a truck at breakneck speed while drunk and wrecked it. And so they gave him ten. Ten days in the guardhouse. However, his own men, who loved him with absolute devotion, were the guards, and they let him out of the guardhouse to go and have fun in the village. So he could have been patient through that guardhouse stretch too. But the political branch began to threaten him with a trial. Now that threat shocked and insulted Kovachenko. It meant, for burying bombs, Ivan, we need you. But for a lousy one-and-a-half-ton truck, off to prison with you. He crawled out the window at night, went over to the Divina River, where a friend's motorboat was hidden, and off he went in it. And it turned out that he wasn't just one more drunk with a short memory. He wanted to avenge himself for everything the political branch had done to him. And in Lithuania, he left his boat and went to the Lithuanians, saying, Brothers, take me to your partisans. Accept me and you won't be sorry. We'll twist their tails. But the Lithuanians decided he was being planted on them. Ivan had a letter of credit sewn in his clothes. He got a ticket to the Kuban. However, en route to Moscow, he got very drunk in a restaurant. Consequently, he squinched up his eyes at Moscow as they were leaving the station and told the taxi driver, Take me to an embassy. Which one? Who the hell cares? Anyone? And the driver took him to one. Which one is that? The French. All right. Perhaps his thoughts got mixed up and his original intentions in going to an embassy had changed into something else. But his cleverness and his strength had in no wise lapsed. Without alerting the policemen at the embassy entrance, he went quietly down a side street and climbed to the top of a smooth wall, double a man's height. In the embassy yard, it was easier. No one discovered him or detained him, and he went on inside, walked through one room, then another, and he saw a table set. There were many things on the table, but what astonished him most was the pears. He felt a yen for them, and he stuffed all the pockets in his field jacket and trousers with them. At that moment, the members of the household came in to dine. Kovachenko began to attack them and shout at them before they could begin on him. You Frenchmen! According to him, France hadn't done anything good for the last century. Why don't you start a revolution? Why are you trying to get de Gaulle into power? And you want us to send our Kuban wheat to you? It's no go. Who are you? Where did you come from? The French were astounded. Immediately adopting the right approach, Kovachenko kept his wits about him. A major of the MGB! The French were frightened. 
But even so, you are not supposed to burst in here. What is your business here? Blank, you in the mouth, Kovachenko bellowed at them straight from the heart. And after playing the hoodlum for them a while longer, he noticed that in the next room they were already telephoning about him. He was still sober enough to begin his retreat, but the pears started to fall out of his pockets, and he was pursued by mocking laughter. And in actual fact he had enough strength left not only to leave the embassy safe and sound, but to move on. The next morning he woke up in Kiev station. Was he not planning to go on to the West Ukraine? And they soon picked him up there. During his interrogation he was beaten by Abakumov personally, and the scars on his back swelled up to a hand's breadth. The minister beat him, of course, not because of the pears, and not because of his valid rebuke to the French, but to find out by whom and when he had been recruited. And, of course, the prison term they handed him was twenty-five years. There are many such stories, but like every railroad car, the Stolypin falls silent at night. At night there won't be any fish, nor water, nor going to the toilet. And the car is filled then with the steady noise of the wheels, which doesn't in the least break the silence. And if, in addition, the convoy guard has left the corridor, one can talk quietly from the third compartment for men with the fourth, or women's, compartment. A conversation with a woman in prison is quite special. There is something noble about it, even if one talks only about articles of the code and prison terms. One such conversation went on all night long, and here are the circumstances in which it took place. It was in July, 1950. There were no passengers in the women's compartment, except for one young girl, the daughter of a Moscow doctor, sentenced under Article 58.10. And there was a big to-do in the men's compartment. The convoy guards began to drive all the zecks out of three compartments into two, and don't even ask how many they piled up in there. And they brought in some offender who was not at all like a convict. In the first place, he hadn't had his head shaved, and his wavy blonde locks, real curls, lay seductively on his big, thoroughbred head. He was young, dignified, and dressed in a British military uniform. He was escorted through the corridor with an air of deference. The convoy itself had been a little awed by the instructions on the envelope containing his case file. And the girl had managed to catch a glimpse of the whole episode, but he himself had not seen her and how much he regretted that later. From the noise and the commotion, she realized that the compartment next to hers had been emptied for him. It was obvious that he was not supposed to communicate with anyone. All the more reason for her to want to talk with him. It wasn't possible in the stolly pin to see from one compartment to another, but when everything was still, you could hear between them. Late at night, when things had begun to quiet down, the girl sat on the edge of her bunk, right up against the grating, and called to him quietly. And perhaps she first sang softly. The convoy guard was supposed to punish her for all this, but the guard itself had settled down for the night, and there was no one in the corridor. The stranger heard her, and, following her instructions, sat in the same position. They were now sitting with their backs to each other, braced against the same one-inch partition, and speaking quietly through the grating at the outer edge of the partition. Their heads were as close as if their lips were kissing, but they could neither touch one another nor see each other. Eric Arvid Andersen understood Russian tolerably well by this time, made many mistakes when he spoke it, but in the end could succeed in communicating his thoughts. He told the girl his astonishing story, and we too will hear about it at the transit prison centre. She, in turn, told him the simple story of a Moscow student who had gotten 5810. But Arvid was fascinated. He asked her about Soviet youth and about Soviet life, and what he heard was not at all what he had learned earlier in leftist Western newspapers and from his own official visit here. They talked all night long, and that night everything came together for Arvid, the strange prisoner's car in an alien country, the rhythmic nighttime clicking of the wheels, which always finds an echo in our hearts, and the girl's melodic voice, her whispers, her breath reaching his ear, his very ear, yet he couldn't even look at her. 
and for a year and a half he hadn't heard a woman's voice. And for the first time, through that invisible, and probably, and of course, necessarily beautiful, girl, he began to see the real Russia, and the voice of Russia told him the truth all night long. One can learn about a country for the first time this way, too. And in the morning he would glimpse Russia's dark, straw-thatched roofs through the window to the sad whispering of his hidden guide. Yes, indeed, all this is Russia, the prisoners on the tracks refusing to voice their complaints, the girl on the other side of the Stolypin partition, the convoy going off to sleep, pears falling out of pockets, buried bombs, and a horse climbing to the second floor. The gendarmes! The gendarmes! The prisoners cried out happily. They were happy that they would be escorted the rest of the way by the attentive gendarmes and not by the convoy. Once again I have forgotten to insert quotation marks. That was Korolenko who was telling us this. V.G. Korolenko, A History of My Contemporary, Moscow, 1955, Volume 3, page 166. We, it is true, were not happy to see the blue caps, but anyone who ever got caught in what the prisoners christened the pendulum would have been glad to see even them. An ordinary passenger might have a difficult time boarding a train at a small way station, but not getting off. Toss your things out and jump off. This was not the case with a prisoner, however, if the local prison guard or police didn't come for him or was late by even two minutes. Toot, toot, the whistle would blow, and the train would get underway, and they would take the poor sinner of a prisoner all the way to the next transit point. And it was all right if it was actually a transit point that they took you to, because they would begin to feed you again there. But sometimes it was all the way to the end of the Stolypin's route, and then they would keep you for 18 hours in an empty car and take you back with a whole new group of prisoners. And then once again, maybe they wouldn't come for you, and once again you'd be in a blind alley, and once again you'd wait there, and during all that time they wouldn't feed you. Your rations, after all, were issued and until your first stop, and the accounting office isn't to blame that the prison messed things up, for you are, after all, listed for Toulon, and the convoy isn't responsible for feeding you out of its own rations, so they swing you back and forth six times. It has actually happened. Irkutsk to Krasnoyarsk, Krasnoyarsk to Irkutsk, Irkutsk to Krasnoyarsk, etc., 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 and when you do see a blue visor on the Toulon platform, you are ready to throw your arms around him. Thank you, beloved, for saving me. You get so worn down, so choked, so shattered in a Stolypin, even in two days' time, that before you get to a big city, you yourself don't know whether you would rather keep going in torment just to get there sooner, or whether you'd rather be put in a transit prison to recover a little. But the convoy guards begin to hustle and bustle. They come out with their overcoats on and knock their gun stocks on the floor. That means they're going to unload the whole car. First, the convoy forms up in a circle at the car steps, and no sooner have you dropped, fallen, tumbled down them, than the guards shout at you deafeningly in unison from all sides, as they have been taught. Sit down, sit down, sit down! This is very effective when several voices are shouting it at once, and they don't let you raise your eyes. It's like being under shell fire, and involuntarily you squirm, hurry, and where is the few to hurry to? Crouch close to the ground and sit down, having caught up with those who disembarked earlier. Sit down is a very clear command, but if you are a new prisoner, you don't yet understand it. When I heard this command on the switching tracks in Ivanovo, I ran, clutching my suitcase in my arms. If a suitcase has been manufactured out in freedom and not in camp, its handle always breaks off and always at a difficult moment and set it down on end on the ground, and without looking around to see how the first prisoners were sitting, sat down on the suitcase. After all, to sit down right on the ties, on the dark, oily sand, in my officer's coat, which was not yet so very dirty, and which still had uncut flaps. The chief of the convoy, a ruddy mug, a good Russian face, broke into a run, and I hadn't managed to grasp what he wanted, and why, until I saw that he meant clearly to plant his sacred boot in my cursed back but something restrained him. However, he didn't spare his polished toe and kicked the suitcase and smashed in the top. Sit down! 
he gritted by way of explanation. Only at that point did it dawn on me that I towered over the surrounding Zex, and without even having the chance to ask, how am I supposed to sit down, I already understood how, and sat down in my precious coat, like everybody else, just as dogs sit at gates and cats at doors. I still have that suitcase, and even now, when I chance to come upon it, I run my fingers around the hole torn in it. It is a wound which cannot heal as wounds heal on bodies or on hearts. Things have longer memories than people. And forcing prisoners to sit down was also a calculated maneuver. If you are sitting on your rear end on the ground, so that your knees tower in front of you, then your center of gravity is well back of your legs, and it is difficult to get up and impossible to jump up. And more than that, they would make us sit as tightly massed together as possible, so that we'd be in each other's way. And if all of us wanted to attack the convoy together, they would have mowed us down before we got moving. They had us sitting there to wait for the Black Mariah. It transports the prisoners in batches. You couldn't get them all in at once. Or else to be herded off on foot. They would try to sit us down someplace hidden, so that fewer free people would see us. But at times they did make the prisoners sit right there, awkwardly on the platform, or in an open square. That is how it was in Quibichef. And it is a difficult experience for the free people. We stare at them quite freely and openly with a totally sincere gaze. But how are they supposed to look at us? With hatred? Their consciences don't permit it. After all, only the Yeremilovs believe that people were imprisoned for cause. With sympathy? With pity? Be careful. Someone will take down your name and they'll set you up for a prison term, too. It's that simple. And our proud free citizens, as in Mayakovsky, read it, envy me, I am a citizen, drop their guilty heads and try not to see us at all, as if the place were empty. The old women are bolder than the rest. You couldn't turn them bad. They believe in God, and they would break off a piece of bread from their meagre loaf and throw it to us. And old camp hands, non-political offenders, of course, weren't afraid either. All camp veterans knew the saying, Whoever hasn't been there yet will get there, and whoever was there won't forget it. And look, they'd toss over a pack of cigarettes, hoping that someone might do the same for them during their next term. And the old woman's bread wouldn't quite carry far enough, what with her weak arm, and it would fall short whereas the pack of cigarettes would arch through the air right into our midst, and the convoy guards would immediately work the bolts of their rifles, pointing them at the old woman, at kindness, at the bread. Come on, old woman, run along. And the holy bread, broken in two, was left to lie in the dust while we were driven off. In general, those minutes of sitting on the ground there at the station were among our very best, I remember that in Omsk we were made to sit down on the railroad ties between two long freight trains. No one from outside entered this alleyway. In all probability they had stationed a soldier at either end. You can't go in there! And even in freedom our people are taught to take orders from anyone in a uniform. It began to grow dark. It was August. The oily station gravel hadn't yet completely cooled off from the sun and warmed us where we sat. We couldn't see the station, but it was very close by, somewhere behind the trains. A phonograph blared dance music, and the crowd buzzed in unison. And for some reason it didn't seem humiliating to sit on the ground in a crowded, dirty mass in some kind of pen. And it wasn't a mockery to hear the dances of young strangers, dances we would never dance. To picture someone on the station platform meeting someone or seeing someone off, maybe even with flowers. It was twenty minutes of near freedom. The twilight deepened, the first stars began to shine, there were red and green lights along the tracks, and the music kept playing. Life was going on without us, and we didn't even mind any more. Cherish such moments, and prison will become easier to bear, otherwise you will explode from rage. And if it was dangerous to herd the Zex along to the Black Mariah because there were streets and people right next to them, then the convoy statutes provided another good command. Link arms! There was nothing humiliating in this. Link arms, 
old men and boys, girls and old women, healthy people and cripples. If one of your hands is hanging on to your belongings, your neighbor puts his arm under that arm and you in turn link your other arm with your other neighbor's. So you have now been compressed twice as tightly as in ordinary formation, and you have immediately become heavier and are hampered by being thrown out of balance by your belongings and by your awkwardness with them, and you sway steadily as you limp. Dirty, grey, clumsy creatures, you move ahead like blind men with an ostensible tenderness for one another, a caricature of humanity. It may well be that no black Mariah at all is there to pet you, and the chief of convoy is perhaps a coward. He is afraid he will fail to deliver you safely, and in this state, weighed down, jouncing as you go, knocking into things, you trudge all the way through the city to the prison itself. There is one more command, which is a caricature of geese. Take hold of your heels! This meant that anyone whose hands were free had to grab both his legs at about ankle height. And now, forward march! Well now, reader, put this book aside. Try going around the room that way. How does it work? And at what speed? How much looking around could you do? And what about escaping? Picture the way three or four dozen such geese look from the side. Kiev, 1940. And it is not necessarily August out. It might be December, 1946. And there being no Black Mariah, you are being herded at 40 degrees below zero to the Petropavlovsk Transit Prison. And it is easy to guess that during the last hours before arriving, the Stolypin convoy refused to go to the trouble of taking you to the toilet so as to avoid getting it dirty. Weakened from interrogation, gripped by the cold, you have a very hard time holding it, women especially. Well, and so what? It's for horses to stand stock still and loose the floodgates. It's for dogs to go lift a leg against a fence. But as for people, you can do it right there while you keep moving. No need to be shy in your own fatherland. It will dry at the transit prison. Vera Konyeva stooped down to adjust her shoe and fell one step behind, and the convoy immediately set the police dog on her, and the dog bit her in the buttocks through all her winter clothing. Don't fall behind! And an Uzbek fell down, and they beat him with their gun stocks and jackboots. Well, that's no tragedy. It won't be photographed for the Daily Express. And the chief of convoy will live to a ripe old age and never be tried by anyone. And the Black Mariahs, too, came down to us from history. In what respect does the prison carriage described by Balzac differ from a Black Mariah? Only that the prison carriage was drawn along more slowly and prisoners weren't packed so tightly. True, in the twenties, columns of prisoners were still being driven afoot through our cities, even Leningrad. They brought traffic to a halt at intersections. So you got caught stealing, came the reproaches from the sidewalks. No one had yet grasped the great plan for sewage disposal. But, always alert to technological trends, the archipelago lost no time in adopting the Black Ravens, more familiarly known simply as Ravens, Black Mariahs. These first Black Mariahs appeared at the same time as the very first trucks on our still cobblestoned streets. Their suspension was poor, and it was very rough riding in them, but then the prisoners weren't made of crystal either. On the other hand, they were very tightly corked, even at that time in 1927. There wasn't one little crack, and there wasn't one little electric light bulb, and there wasn't any air to breathe, and it was impossible to see out. And even in those days, they stood so tightly packed inside that there wasn't any room left at all. And it wasn't that all this was intentionally planned. There simply weren't enough wheels to go around. For many years, the Black Mariahs were steel grey and had, so to speak, prison written all over them. But in the biggest cities after the war, they had second thoughts and decided to paint them bright colours and to write on the outside, Bread. The prisoners were the bread of construction or meat, it would have been more accurate to write bones, or even simply, drink Soviet champagne. Inside, the Black Mariahs might consist of a simple armoured body or shell, an empty enclosure, or perhaps there were benches against the walls all the way round. This was in no sense a convenience, but the reverse. They would push in just as many prisoners as could be inserted standing up, but in this case, they would be piled on top of each other like baggage, one bale on another. 
The Black Maria might also have a box in the rear, a narrow steel closet for one prisoner. Or it might be boxed throughout, single closets that locked like cells along the right and left-hand walls, with a corridor in the middle for the turnkey. One was hardly likely to imagine that interior like a honeycomb when looking at that laughing maiden on the outside, drink Soviet champagne. They drive you into the Black Mariahs to the tune of the same shouts coming from the convoy from all sides at once. Come on there, get a move on quick. And so that you shouldn't have time to look around and figure out how to escape, you are shoved and pushed so that you and your bag get stuck in a narrow little door and you knock your head against the lintel. The steel rear door slams shut with a bang, and off you go. It was rare, of course, to spend hours in a black maria, twenty to thirty minutes were more likely, but you got flung around, it was a bone breaker, it crushed all your insides during those half hours, your head stooped if you were tall, and you remembered the cosy stolly pin with longing. And the black maria means one thing further, it is a reshuffling of the deck, new encounters, and among them, those which stand out most clearly are, of course, your encounters with the thieves. You may never happen to be in the same compartment with them, and maybe they won't put you in the same cell with them, even at the transit prison. But here in the Black Mariah, you are in their hands. But sometimes it is so crowded that even the thieves, the Urki, find it awkward to filch. Your legs and your arms are clamped between your neighbors' bodies and bags as tightly as if they were in stock. Only when all of you are tossed up and down and all your insides are shaken up by ruts and bumps can you change the position of your legs and arms. Sometimes, in less crowded circumstances, the thieves can check out the contents of all the bags in just half an hour and appropriate all the bacilli, the fats and goodies, and the best of the trash, the clothing. Cowardly and sensible considerations most likely restrain you from putting up a fight against them, and crumb by crumb you are already beginning to lose your immortal soul, still supposing that the main enemies and the main issues lie somewhere ahead, and that you must save yourself for them. And you might just throw a punch at them once and get a knife in the ribs then and there. There would be no investigation, and even if there should be one, it wouldn't threaten the thieves in any way. They would only be delayed at the transit prison instead of going to the far-off camp. You must concede that in a fight between a socially friendly prisoner and a socially hostile prisoner, the state simply could not be on the side of the latter. In 1946, retired Colonel Lunin, a high-ranking official in Oso Aviakim, the Society for Assistance to Defense and to Aviation Chemical Construction of the USSR, recounted in a Butirki cell how the thieves in a Moscow Black Maria on March the 8th, International Women's Day, during their transit from the city court to Taganka prison, gang raped a young bride in his presence, and amid the silent passivity of everyone else in the van. That very morning the girl had come to her trial a free person, as attractively dressed as she could manage. She was on trial for leaving her work without official permission, which in itself was a repulsive fabrication worked up by her chief in revenge for her refusal to live with him. A half hour before the Black Mariah, the girl had been sentenced to five years under the tree and had then been shoved into this Black Mariah and right there in broad daylight, somewhere on the park ring, drink Soviet champagne, had been turned into a camp prostitute. And are we really to say that it was the thieves who did this to her and not the jailers and not her chief? And thief tenderness too, having raped her, they robbed her. They took the fashionable shoes with which she had hoped to charm the judges, and her blouse, which they shoved through to the convoy guards who stopped the van and went off to get some vodka and handed it in so the thieves could drink at her expense too. And when they got to the Taganka prison, the girl sobbed out her complaint, and the officer listened to her, yawned, and said, The government can't provide each of you with individual transportation. We don't have such facilities. Yes? The Black Mariahs are a bottleneck of the archipelago. If there is no possibility of separating the politicals from the criminals and the stolypins, then it isn't possible to keep women separate from men in the Black Mariahs. And just how could one expect the thieves not to live it up en route from one jail to another? Well, and if it weren't for the thieves, we would have to be grateful to the Black Mariahs for our brief encounters with women. 
Where, if not here, is one to see them, hear them, and touch them in a prison existence? Once, in 1950, they were transporting us from the Butyrki to the station in a not at all crowded van, 14 people in a black mariah with benches. Everyone sat down and suddenly they pushed in one more, a woman, alone. She sat down beside the rear door, fearfully at first. After all, she was totally defenceless against 14 men in a dark cell. But it became clear after a few words that all those present were comrades. 58. She gave us her name, Repina, a colonel's wife, and she had been arrested right after he had. And suddenly a silent military man, so young and thin that it seemed he had to be a lieutenant, said to her, Tell me, weren't you arrested with Antonina I? What, are you her husband? Oleg? Yes, Lieutenant Colonel I, from the Funza Academy? Yes. What a yes that was. It emerged from a trembling throat, and in it there was more fear of finding out something bad than there was happiness. He sat down next to her, twilight shafts of summer daylight diffused through two microscopic gratings in the two rear doors, flickered around the interior as the van moved along and across the faces of the woman and the lieutenant colonel. She and I were imprisoned in the same cell for four months while she was undergoing interrogation. Where is she now? All that time she lived only for you. Her fears weren't for herself, but were all for you. First that they shouldn't arrest you, and then later that you should get a lighter sentence. But what has happened to her now? She blamed herself for your arrest. Things were so hard for her. Where is she now? Just don't be frightened. And Rapina put her hands on his chest, as if he were her own skin. She simply couldn't endure the strain. They took her away from us. She you know, became, well, a little confused. You understand? And that tiny storm, boxed in sheets of steel, rolled along so peacefully in the six-lane automobile traffic, stopped at traffic lights and signaled for a turn. I had met Oleg I and the Butirki just a few moments before, and here is how it happened. They had herded us into the station box and had brought us our things from the storage room. They called him and me to the door at the same moment. Through the opened door into the corridor, we could see a woman, jailer, rifling the contents of his suitcase, and she flung out of it and onto the floor a golden shoulder board with the stars of a lieutenant colonel that had survived until then all by itself. Heaven only knows how. She herself hadn't noticed it, and she had accidentally stepped on its big stars with her foot. She had trampled it with her shoe, exactly as in a film shot. I said to him, Direct your attention to that, comrade lieutenant colonel. And he glowered. After all, he still had his ideas about the spotlessness of the service. And now, here was the next thing, about his wife. And he had had only one hour to fit all this in.